everybody. Dr. Ariel Ellis here and wanted to come on and have a conversation with you as a part of this series, um, particularly this conversation being around diversity, equity, and inclusion. As you know, I run a consultancy, Advisory 83, uh, where we specifically focus on strategic planning, coaching, communication, training, and education in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And uh, have a series of a video that I'm gonna be sharing with you, but particularly this one today, I wanna have a conversation around the state of, if you will, diversity, equity, inclusion, and why DEI, DEI is an acronym for short, is not going away. Um, we've seen a lot in uh, the past three years, I wanna say actually the past 10 years, with organizations needing to think about ways in which they are prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion for their organizational culture. And of course, we've seen it much more uh, pre, right, right around, I would say, maybe a year or two before COVID hit, we heard more and more conversations being had around DNI. And then, of course, when COVID hit, there was a little bit of a quiet phase because nobody knew what was going on. Uh, but when George Floyd was murdered, uh, we saw an influx of companies wanting to have conversations around DEI, want to develop programs, wanting to um, identify ways in which their culture could be very DEI centric, um, mainly because their employees were speaking out, mainly because um, their audiences or the, the public in general was saying, hey, what are these companies doing uh, as it relates to uh, caring for, speaking to the issues of people of color, people, in various communities who may be considered, if you will, marginalized or underserved. Uh, what are these corporations going to do about that? Um, do they have people who have a seat at the table? Do they have tables that allow people to come bring their own seat uh, because they'll have a voice and their power will be leveraged for the sake of others? So we saw a lot of these conversations. And the reason why I wanted to center um, this conversation as a part of um, this series, video series, is not simply because it's the work that my team and I do, but mainly because I was having a conversation with a trusted, loving, kind, amazing, long time, I want to say mentor of mine, but someone who has known me since I was in college and and, and kind of snatched me up and just said, hey, you're going to come learn from me, right? Um, but a uh, phenomenal woman uh, based in California and has always been an advocate, let me say that, has always been an advocate for me. And um, having a conversation, she asked me a phenomenal question. So what do you think companies were really going through at the death of George Floyd and at the height of those convert those DEI conversations? What were companies actually going through? I want to share with you what my insights were, and I also share with you some of the insights that I think have come about since then that are now having organizations uh, or individuals question if the, the intentionality around DEI was really genuine then during those times. So just so you know, of course, you'll see the video or the date on this video that says um, 2023. So you'll be able to think back. If you're watching this, you'll be able to think back to 2020 and how we were all in shock in March of 2020, approximately almost a year ago to the week or to the date, actually to the week that I'm actually recording this video three years ago. Um, we we were all uh, sheltering in place and sent home and on lockdown orders and no toilet paper, <laughs> right? So frenzy in a frenzy, trying to figure out what was happening in our world. Um, and so from that point on, up until I would say the first two or so months of us being in this um, state of emergency, Companies were quiet around their DEI efforts because we were, again, in a state of emergency. So they're trying to figure out what do we do? How do we transition to work from home? Who should work from home? How do we define essential worker? Uh, 
What is essential? Who is essential and who is it? Will we need to lay people off? Will we be able to keep the doors open? All these very critical, very, very critical questions, very critical decisions that need to be made um, by organizations and their leaders. So it wasn't until George Floyd was murdered that companies started to get very loud about their intentionality and their need for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then as they, their culture revealed itself in new ways, they started to see even the need to consider if DEI and what they called DEI as the functionality inside of their organization needed to have another word or the acronym needed to look differently, or maybe if we're prioritizing inclusion and we want to center uh, one of these words as uh, in, in, in a chronological order or an order of importance, an order of priority, maybe we need to move the D around and put the I here, the E first, or maybe we need to add the word belonging. Oh, maybe we need to add ex access or accessibility, or maybe we need to add social justice. So we saw many organizations determining what does this look like for our organization? How do we best serve our external community, our customer base, those who uh, uh, are, are stakeholders of our organization. And then also, of course, and most importantly, how do we create community for our employees in ways that we have not had to create before, where many of them are at home. And if they're not at home and they're still coming to the to the office and to the building every day, they're coming with a different set of challenges. Um, loss of loved ones, increases in uh, in 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 uh, health issues, uh, uh, a lot of of course workplace workplace productivity as it relates to individuals having to quarantine because a loved one and in in or someone in their house or a neighbor or whoever they were around uh had tested positive for covid so that's a workplace productivity productivity concern um also seeing incidences of uh more concerns around mental health uh, things of that nature right uh so culture of organizations shifting, changing. And so my dear advocate asked me, Ariel, what did organizations have to do? What did they do? What was going on during this time? And I can tell you, I was gonna briefly tell you what I sensed, or what I not just what I sensed, <laughs> what my team and I experienced during this time. And then I want to end with some very critical reasons why DEI is not going away. Do not be deceived. Just because there was an influx in the desire to pursue DEI inside of these organizations, there is no indication, absolutely no indication of DEI going away in any way. <laughs> um, this particular um, framework has been around long before we ever even knew, many of us even re really ever knew what it was. Because quite frankly, some people are still learning what DNI is or diversity, equity, inclusion, however you want to say it. They're still learning what it is. Um, so it's not necessarily going away. I even did a video in 2018, which I'll probably redo this video. You can go back and I'll tag it for you. I did a video in 2018. I believe it was September of 2018, uh, talking about why diversity training, why your diversity training won't work. And I gave some very key things about why diversity training can work, but why yours won't work if you don't do some very specific things. So no, this DEI thing is not a fad. It's not going away. I know what has happened recently in the state of Florida with the governor there. It's not going away, especially not in the corporate space not in the nonprofit space, not even in a global sense. It is not going away. 
But these were some of the things that I experienced that uh, my team and I experienced. I want to share with you that my dear advocate made me think of, and I thought immediately to share them with you. And then I'll kind of circle back with what I think or what I know is going to truly uh, support what it means to have good DEI efforts and and why um, why it matters and, and why it may not matter for the most part to prove that there is a need and it will not go away. One, one in particular, DEI is a practice. It's not a tagline. It's not a slogan. It's a real practice, just like you practice HR, just like I come from the PR world. I've, I've practiced public relations. Uh, you practice nursing, you practice accounting. DEI is a practice. It is not going away. One of the things I noticed uh, that I shared with my uh, dear advocate was that um, when we were in the thick of things in 2020, shortly after George Floyd died and we started to take on so many different clients, those clients were asking, how do we create meaningful DEI efforts? And one of the things that was important to note which is one of the reasons why it's not going away, is that it takes time. It takes time to be able to build a culture that is DEI-centered, especially when you are attempting to build that culture as a result or re, or in, in reaction to, um, in, a, in a preemptive sense, right? In a reaction to a cultural concern or a cultural issue uh, or some type of cultural outcry. It's going to take time to build that culture, even when it is not preemptive and is not reactive. It is going to take time to build a, build a culture that is very holistic. So reason number one. Reason number two, the DEI is not going away. And again, notice this in working with those clients early on uh, or in the midst of COVID shortly after the death of George Floyd, is that our world is becoming and will continue to come increasingly diverse, no matter how individuals try to <laughs> blind themselves and not see it. Our world is going to continue to have diversity and any company worth its salt is going to want to have efforts. And not just efforts, but a workplace demographic that reflects their consumer base. And even if they don't quite have that, right? They are still going to think of, need to think about ways that their organization is appealing to a diverse workforce or a diverse uh, customer base or diverse donor base. It's a win-win. So as we think about this, what I like to call, instead of racial minority, I like to call it an emerging majority. And I may have heard others, this may have come from the PR world, others may have said this too. But that for that particular reason, the fact that we can look at our demographics in the U.S., and our racial and ethnic gra uh, demographics across the globe and see that our spe specifically racial and ethnic diversity is not going anywhere. <laughs> the minority, what we consider to be the minority community is just gonna continue to increase and grow. So that's another reason why DEI isn't going away. Another reason why DEI isn't going away, and again, I'm, I'm leaning back to many of the experiences with our company growing over 300% in the pandemic and organizations trying to respond to, uh, to the, the needs and the, the demands of DEI. Number three is that we're in the future of work. The future of work is here right now, and it is demanding uh, new and creative ways for leaders to listen and to adapt to for people to be more human in their experience. I always say this, and I said this on a podcast. I think it was uh, with my friend Anthony O'Neill on his podcast. Um, organizations are made of people and people are human. And in going through the pandemic and seeing what we saw with the protests, the social injustice, the, 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 the social unrest and the racial injustice and all those things, it reminded us that we're humans. It reminded us that we have feelings and needs and concerns and values and morals. 
and interests and skills and talents, that we are not just robots at work. So while the future at work in a contextually may have us thinking about robots and machinery and AI and wait, AI, yeah, uh, and all of that, that is true. That's another factor too why DEI isn't going away. But the future of work requires us to have new, innovative, disruptive, creative ways for people to listen and to adapt to what they hear. I call it active listening. People want to be more human when they show up, right? That's why when you may be on Zoom with a colleague or in the in the heat of COVID, we would see the cat crawl crawl across the screen or the baby's crying in the background or the kid needs help with their homework or the washing machine is going on or the dryer just went off. Whatever that is, that humanistic element, we can no longer deny that. And so that is requiring us to look beyond just an organizational structure as it relates to culture and start to look at the values of individuals and incorporate that into our organizations. So DEI isn't going anywhere. I may do, there's so much more that I could say about this and I may do another video unpacking this even a little bit more, but those are the reasons. One is that our work itself, our work itself, is getting to be or has become more and more uh, diverse and needing to be equitable and more inclusive. Our work is requiring us to be more human. Our the demand of our of of the consumer is requiring us to listen more closely. Our world demographically is becoming more and more diverse. So none of this is really going anywhere, no matter how many DEI. Uh, positions are are eliminated, no matter how many um, chief diversity officer positions get turned around and, and restructured and who leaves this company or that company. These efforts aren't really going anywhere. Maybe they'll be called something different in the next five to 10 years, but the work isn't going anywhere. The work of diversity, equity, inclusion is not going anywhere, especially as it becomes more and more embedded into the culture of an organization, not baked in, which is a type of language I don't necessarily care for. We've said DEI should be baked into culture. And I say no to that, or I push back. I don't say no. I push back against that because <laughs> I baked I like to cook. For those of you who follow me on Instagram, I, I have a thing called culinary therapy. So I love to cook. I, I consider myself an amateur chef. Chef. And this year, 2023, I have pursued more fruits and vegetables, no meats, very much of a plant-based diet, if you will. And just yesterday, I decided to make a plant-based soul food meal. And everything but the cornbread muffins that I made, they were vegan, but everything but that was plant-based. And I'm mixing, as I think about what it took to make those cornbread muffins, I'm mixing, I recall myself less than a little over 24 hours ago, mixing the, the ingredients for my vegan cornbread muffins, my gluten-free vegan cornbread muffins with my vegan soul food dinner on a Sunday after church. Once I mixed everything in together and I put the batter into the muffin pan, put the muffin pan into the oven, already preheated, let it do its thing, set the timer, 20 minutes, the muffins are done. Let the muffins cool, get the muffin out, put it on top of my greens, just like I like it. Oh, if I were to just break apart the pieces of the muffin, I can't tell what's what. I can't see the oil. I can't see the milk. I can't see the honey because I like to put honey in my muffins. I can't see the cornmeal. I can't see the salt. I can't see the baking powder, but I know it's in there. So that's a little diversion from what I was specifically talking about. But the reason why baked in from a language standpoint, contextually and even technically does not work 
is because I don't want my DEI baked in. I want it as a living, breathing part of the culture, but I don't want it baked in at the expense of me not being able to see the results of it. I can see the result of that cornbread muffin, right? <laughs> I can see the result of putting those ingredients together. I can see that. But once it's all baked in, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what I put in. I don't know what, so if I gave it to someone, they wouldn't know what it took to put those things together or what went into that batter in order to produce the thing that was baked. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox about that. But the reason why DEI isn't going anywhere is because society, culture will not allow it to go anywhere. Our world will continue to evolve to the extent that we will need DEI more and more and more, regardless of who got quiet about it, regardless of what companies are now shifting their focus to ESG or whatever they want to focus on now, or just figuring out the new norm, work from home, remote work. No, DEI isn't going anywhere. Unfortunately, that may take another crisis for people to really figure out how to get it right and how to plug in. But the reality is it's not going anywhere. I have my time is, is up. Um, I said I would share some things with you and I will, but I will do a second video to kind of unpack these things. But in, in, in DEI, in the Declaration of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion as a practice is not going anywhere is for the same reasons, and I gave you some reasons, but it's for the same reasons, as I said, these efforts need to really be uh, looked at differently and how we as organizations or even as consultants are, and practitioners are going about the work need to be able to look at it differently. One in particular is the fact that we look at people of color People of color, for the most part, aren't impressed. You know why? Because we're not as impressed to see what's going on in society. So much of what is disappointing and disheartening in society is being mirrored inside of our organizations. So unless there's more respect, more engagement, more loyalty, more uh, sincerity in the policies and procedures and the relationships and all those things, and how people feel, that's the equity or the inclusion piece, right? And how people feel, then we'll always run into these issues, right? Hence another reason why it's not going anywhere. Another reason why DEI isn't going anywhere. Now I'm on the effort side. We're talking about efforts. I gave you kind of the anecdotal pieces based on what I see, but now we're talking about what it means as it relates to efforts. So first effort, for the most part, not going anywhere, People of color who generally DEI efforts are developed to support don't always get the support. Like the results of DEI work don't always support people of color the way that it's intended to. Sometimes it help, it hurts people of color inside the organization, um, which is, is unfortunately sometimes those efforts do backfire. Um, another reason why DEI isn't going aware as a, a get, isn't going anywhere as it relates to efforts is because of biases. We are always going to have biases. We're always going to have unconscious biases. And, and there's nothing wrong with us inherently having unconscious bias. Every human being has unconscious bias. It is just a psychological uh, fact that our brains, consider the word bias, think of the word preference. Our brain has these unconscious preferences, okay? Um, but the reality is, Many times leaders inside of organizations don't really come to recognize their unconscious biases, <laughs> which another effort, right, that needs to be addressed and constantly put to the put to the forefront. Um, most people who are acting on their biases don't really realize that they're doing it. So again, those are things that need to be addressed and dealt with. Um, and then two, and I, I really truly will in here, um, as I said earlier about 
when COVID hit and organizations were just at a standstill in a state of emergency, did not make the connection that COVID is an issue of DEI. They're one and the same, like completely <laughs> one and the same. Your strategy with COVID is not unrelated to your strategy around DEI. It just it isn't. But for 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 the early stages of COVID, this is what was a factor, right? And then people soon, I think some organizations still don't quite realize that your DEI work is or your COVID. Uh, responses, your COVID um, efforts, initiative, whatever you're, you're using to navigate and or whatever you use to navigate and address and respond to COVID, that is truly a part of also your DEI approach because you have so many, you're dealing with everyone, you're dealing with everyone's life, you're dealing with people's lifestyles, you're dealing with their, their how they how they move about the world, how they participate inside of your organization, that is a part of it. And this is the last thing I'll share with you as it relates to efforts and reasoning why DEI isn't going anywhere and why some efforts have failed, which even make us think about having the consideration that DEI would even be going anywhere, is because we've treated DEI as a strategy. We've treated it as this training, as an event. We're going to have a speaker at our leadership retreat. We're going to have a, a speaker at a conference. We're going to have a training. You can come if you want to. Um, the DEI approach is incorporated into like talent acquisition and retention strategy, which is really linked to getting and engaging and retraining, uh, uh, um, retaining. Let me start over. Linked to your talent acquisition. And retention strategy is linked to attracting, engaging, acquiring, retaining, advancing those who do their best work, right? The best talent who is inside of your organization. But if that is seen as solely a strategy and not again as a holistic approach out for the whole organization, Culturally, the DEI is all across the culture of the organization. Again, not necessarily baked in because you got to be able to see it. You got to be able to see the results of it, the fruit of it, the impact of it, what ingredients went to it, went into it, what made this piece work, what made that piece work. So again, I'm not an advocate for saying the DEI should be baked in. In some aspects, yes. In other aspects, no. But it cannot just be a strategy because a strategy is something that you can truly check the box on. Did we produce this strategy? The strategy needs to exist. Don't get me wrong. But the strategy needs to be something as it's being measured, it's also being lived out. So we're really more so talking about culture, right? So again, I'll leave it there because I can go on and on, but I want to thank my dear, one of my dear advocates uh, for triggering, triggering those thoughts in me and um, which was a video I was probably going to bring to you all anyway, but uh, bringing it just a little sooner than I thought that I would um, because of our timely and uh, very important uh, conversation and the question that she asked me about. What do you what do you think organizations have been going through as it relates to DEI during COVID and during that time of all the racial and social injustice? And um is it going away or organizations do they what are they doing? Do they still care? So this is just a, a quick uh, rundown for what's on the top of my head and heart at the time. And I have more to share, but I'm going to stop here. I welcome you to visit my website, arielellis.com. Um, if you're, you or your organization needs to book a call with me uh, to discuss anything related to DEI, communication, intercultural competence, or just coaching, leadership, development for you, your team, your employees, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and uh, also my company is advisory83, advisory83.com, but you can reach me directly at my website, arielellis.com. You can also reach out to me on email at hello at arielellis.com. Mm -hmm.